Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be trying to answer a question from one of my viewers. It was a while back, and I apologize. I, I forgot completely about this, and so uh, tonight I was going through some books, and I went, you know, I remember somebody asking me this question. The, the question was, what books do you read? Which ones that, that did you get all your knowledge from? I, I don't I don't know. Most It wasn't from books, I can tell you that, but... Uh, I can tell. I, I will share it with you with the books. It was experience, not the books, that really did more for me. But let's go through some of these, and uh, right after this. Okay, so <laughs> where to start? I, I guess I'm going to break these up into into categories, and these are some of the favorite, my favorite books, and this has to do with. Uh, computer technologies, it has to do with Linux, it has to do with Unix. Uh, and and so, yeah, some of these are going to be relatively old and some of them aren't. So th this book is called um, Modern Operating Systems by Tannenbaum. And, and I'll put uh, I'll put some links below. They are, yeah, so, and and you can, you can look at those. Uh, pay attention to the disclaimer before the links. Just make sure you understand that. So yeah, he goes through a lot of different things here. I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna. This is a copyrighted work, so I have to be careful. But uh, yeah, he goes through like the history and and goes way back into the dark ages and computer hardware. Uh, you know about the mainframes and the servers and the junk that came before. And then he goes. So his purpose was he was teaching people how to understand operating systems and he had written uh, an operating system called Minix. So that's kind of the central focus of this book and it's pretty good. I mean it if you're trying to understand all of the things that go into an operating system this is a good place to begin. None of this has changed. Uh, they've added on some things but none of the basics here have changed. <laughs> this is all I mean I can tell you that that yeah this is all current stuff. I mean I did find this one available online. So this one is, this is where I started. This is the first book I was given in class uh, at at and and this is the Unix programming in, uh, environment. Uh, and this is by uh, Brian Kernigan and Rob Pike, both of which were from Bell Labs. So this gives a, this has a really good section on it. So uh, it starts out with Unix for beginners uh, and then it goes through the file system. Now, the file system is a little bit different in Unix than it is uh, Linux, but you know the basic idea is the same. And then they go through shell, and you'll find most of that will work. Filters are current. That I mean, the, the filters are still there. Shell programming is still there. Programming with standard I/O. That's kind of important to understand because in Unix and Linux, there are actually three devices that are standard no matter what. They're standard in, standard out, and standard error. So those three devices are always present and you can do a lot with those. You can redirect them, you can pipe them away, you can combine the two and pipe them to dev null if you want to, don't want to read anything that comes from them. Uh, the system call functions uh, in this manual will not help you uh, because these are Unix system calls and Unix was abbreviated. Uh, Dennis Ritchie did not want all the system calls that Linux has. He would have been appalled. He's dead now, but he would be totally appalled at what Linux has done to his, his idea. And then it goes into some basic program development. And this is C. So it's K and R C. So yeah, I mean, that is the that was the basis of Unix and it is the basis of Linux as well. The other one uh, on the operating system would be the design of the Unix operating system by Maurice Beige. I don't have that. It's a, it's a book. Um, I don't think there has ever been digitized, the best of my knowledge. I mean, a, lo a lot of the hard copy stuff is going to be kind of expensive. So if you can borrow it from a library, great, do that. Because uh, it is, it's more of a, that, that book is more of a guide for someone that wants to write code in order to interface with uh, the operating system. And so it goes through sockets and it goes through uh, programming uh, interrupts and how to do inter -communicate, inter program communication. And it, it really lays down all the groundwork for 
uh, the internals of Unix, and a lot of those in internals carry over into Linux because Linux patterned itself after Unix. So this one, this one is probably more relevant to Linux uh, than the Maurice Bash one is because this one, this this talks about the backstory with Unix, getting started with the kernel, where to find it, and so forth, and then. They, they talk about how to build it, and then there's all kinds of things in here. If you want to dig into it, there's the process management pieces. There's the process scheduler. Yeah, it goes, this is a very in-depth book on the kernel. Now, so if you're looking, so there's really two things here. So I was interested in compiler design, so I got, I took a course that was based on what was called the Dragon Book. That is a 1986 book. It's called uh, Compilers, and the look because it's been so long. Compiler Principles, Techniques, and Tools, and that was done by a number of authors. Uh, AO was one of them. That is probably the best book on compiler design that I have ever seen. It, they don't build compilers any way differently than that book describes. In fact, a lot of the compiler development that is still done today is based on what that book teaches. So yeah, it, it has been updated. They've added modern stuff into it. They, they have put in uh, all of the new things that we have learned since 1986 about compiler design and incorporated that into the book. So I still think that is, I still think that is the seminal uh, book on compiler design that you'll probably find. The other one, of course, is the C programming language. That's the K&R edition by Kernighan and Ritchie. Uh, that still, I have that book. It's a hard copy, but it's upstairs. So yeah, um, that is still the that's still the guide that most people still use. I think it's still a bestseller, even today, even though it came out years ago. And I, it's been re, again redone several times. I think it does include ANSI C, so it's not all the way up to the. C11 standards. Uh, learning Python. This one, um, he talks about. They begin with a general overview of what Python is. Python is actually a pretty good language to learn as your first one. You can do both object oriented and you can do functional programming in in uh, Python. Uh, so yeah, you can learn both things. So and you can use both things in developing your programs. It's more procedural, I guess, would probably be a better way of saying it. But so yeah, there's different parts where they go through the different sections of of the fundamentals of the language. You know, I always think it's kind of funny that, you know, once you learn one language, you pretty much have the basis for learning the next one. Uh, because the, the difference mostly is in syntax, um, characteristics of the different variable types, and then basically what are the rules? I mean, do I have to declare the variable? Is it like Fortran? Can I just pull the variable out of thin air? Or do I have to declare it first? And at what level it has to be declared? So yeah, I mean, it, so yeah, and then this is a good start, right? This is a good start. So yeah, it, as you can see, I'm scrolling back, scrolling back, scrolling back. There's a lot in here. This is applicable to both Unix, so it would work for BSD as well as Linux. They cover both. Uh, so they have a where to start here. So depending upon what you're interested in, is, it, is what, are you a assisted man? Are you a programmer? Are you are you doing operations testing operations? What are you? And then it'll go through, it'll recommend what areas of the book that you should go through. So it talks about booting and grub and FreeBSD and SystemD. It talks about access control, process control, file systems, software installation, scripting in the shell, user management. I did a video on this some time ago. This is BPF Performance Tool. You know, like just like everything else, yes, I am using Kindle. Uh, so just like everything else, there's an introduction to explain what the Berkeley packet filters are. And uh, also there's the technology background. There's all kinds of things here like uh, uh, your flame graphs, your probes that you want to use, trace points. What are you trying to find out? Where, where do you, you know, you're trying to identify what the bottleneck is in your machine. And then there's some steps here for performance analysis, what kinds of things to do to drill into the problem. Because sometimes 
uh, performance problems are usually multiple problems. Uh, I remember I remember we had actually had three problems that was go, were going on in the system. We had network cards that were misconfigured that were running in half duplex, for example. We had DNS misconfiguration and such that uh, it was supposed to be a split brain DNF, uh, DNS and it was neither. <laughs> and it was trying to be all. So I, and that got pretty screwed up and that was taking some time to find, you know, the address, the IP address. And then there was some misconfiguration in the kernel uh, and, and that was slowing down its ability to handle applications because everything was running at a real low priority. So, yeah, sometimes it's more than just one problem that you're facing. I mean, if you want to know the in-depth of everything about TCP IP from version 4 to version 6 to, you know, how it all the different layers, um, its addressing and how that works. Uh, it's uh, how it does IPv6 addressing and how that works. Yeah, so yeah, it, it talks about everything. I mean, it, 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 and this goes on. It's about, oh, maybe a thousand pages. I, uh, it, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. 719 by the time it gets to the index. So, but there's some, there's some online resources at the end. This is actually a textbook. So I was, uh, I was working, uh, I was working at a hospital. At, anyway, I was working for this hospital and uh, as a, as a consultant at that time, I was a consultant working for them, but a consultant. And one of the network guys, he was big network, and it was a network guy. He just thought network was the, you know, he wanted to paint everything red. And, you know, just if it doesn't, it wasn't painted in network red. It just it didn't exist. So. And we had, I had Cisco in and we were talking to them because one of the projects I was working on required TCP IP. Well, <laughs> network claimed to do TCP IP, but it, I mean, some of the testing I did showed that they didn't really know what the hell they were doing. Um, and so I had Cisco come in and I was talking to them and I, I invited, out of courtesy, the, the network engineer the, to come and, and sit with me and, and listen. And and uh, and he started espousing. Well, that's not how network does it. The network does TCP/IP this way. And the guy from Cisco just looked at him and said, "You know, I would not consider network to be the the expert on TCP/IP ever." <laughs> and that just shut him up. He was just like shocked. He couldn't believe that the guy told him that. I just remember the look on his face. It was classic. It was one of those deer in the headlights look. It was like, "Oh my God, what am I going to tell this guy?" Uh, okay, next one. This one's an older book. Uh, this is DNS and Bind. So this one will touch on some of the security protocols, but not all of them. So if you're looking for modern stuff like DNS over uh, HTTP and or you know over TLS, then you're probably going to want to go find another book. But this one, if you're looking for the basics on how to set up a DNS server and how to have it replicate to a secondary server, how to do things like split brain and manage those kinds of things that you would find in a normal corporate environment, particularly if, if you're trying to serve you know, outs, outside customers as well as inside uh, users, then yeah, um, yeah, it's a good book. It, it's at least, at least from the standpoint of how DNS works, what it actually does, and what things you need to avoid. It talks about, you know, there's some things in here that are like best practices. Uh, there are things on, you know, using troubleshooting because DNS can go horribly wrong. And when it does, your performance will tank. Um, it'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the message formats and so forth. So this book is pretty good, and I think there's been an update since this one, 2022, maybe, or it's coming. Uh, but this is really a good starting point. When when I got this, I was putting up, I was just starting to get into Kubernetes and starting to build pods and, and playing around with it a little bit. And, and I went through the Google stuff, and it was like, what? I, I didn't get it. I just was like, over my head. So I got this, and it this helped. This really helped. I, it it uh, it explained it in in uh, a practical way, which was here's just how you set something up to get it to run, 
And that's really what I was looking for. I didn't care about the theory and all the esoteric underlying technologies that make it so great. What I wanted to know, I already knew that. I knew it was great because people were using it. But what I wanted to know was, how do I make it work for me? How do I take this pro, this application workload that I have and and push it over onto a Kubernetes cluster so that I can have as close to five nines or six nines as I can get without you know having having outages and crazy crap happening? Or how can I take down a system to do maintenance on it without completely bombing off every every application that we're running? So yeah, this is really good. And then it goes through some of the threat models and some of the security issues that you have. Although I've got some better ones for that too. So, but this is a really good practical guide to get you started. Is it the e all end all book for Kubernetes? No, no, no. But it'll get you started. It'll 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 get you enough that you'll you can be dangerous. So that brings up this one, and there's a bunch of books here. Uh, this is these are a series of three there's uh and i i just like the way these are written and and uh, i mean they're put together for people like me that are completely dumb and puts it into into uh, a workable format so that you understand what the threat environment is and when you're trying to build a security posture you're trying to talk to your boss about what the risks are this is a good place to start. I mean, understanding what now, like all books, I mean, as soon as you read this, it's out of date. But at least it would be a good place to start and say, hey, this is the stuff you had to do two years ago, and this is, and you haven't done anything. So you're in real trouble. <laughs> you know, that, that was how I used this book, and it, and it worked. Um, but this one also has, it actually has some really good uh, things in it for pen testing. So if you're interested in becoming a pen tester, that's what this was designed for. It's uh, different ways that you can try to uh, gain access to a system to show shortfalls in their security and their security methodology. Um, yeah, and it, it's based on Kali. So if you're using, if you're familiar with Kali Linux, uh, you probably are already familiar with this guy <laughs> because they talk about it all the time on their on their site. Also, the Cali books that are done uh, by the Cali team itself are pretty good as well, So, and those are free. So if you're interested in DevOps, there's several books on Jenkins. I don't have any on Jenkins because Jenkins in the development part of the environment that I was responsible for and with had an architect that dealt with that. So it wasn't me. I was systems. I, I didn't care about the development side. Jenkins was more important to them because they had that tied into their software development model and they pushed their systems out through Jenkins, which then built it into a system that would then go into the uh, source code control system and the bug tracking system. So, and <clears throat> that, that I didn't mess with, but there are, there's, there's some really good books on that. I work more with Ansible, so Ansible I still use. I use that to manage my systems here. And there's a really good book called Ansible for DevOps, and it's done by Jeff Gerling. Uh, and he also has a YouTube channel, by the way. Uh, so check that out and, and look for his book. I'll, I'll put a link in my show notes here today where you can find it. Again, read the disclaimer. Um, and let's see, what about... What about must read? So this one, <laughs> this book, uh, this is the, let me drive all the way back here. So this is the Mythical Man Month. The Mythical Man Month was, I've said this before, but in case you haven't heard this from me, the Mythical Man Month was written in the 70s. And it, and it was, the, the, the person that wrote this was, Actually, he actually explains all this. Was was Frederick Brooks, and he wrote. He was the author of OS 360. So he for I he worked for IBM, and he actually was the one that was the project lead for OS 360. Well, OS 360 was successful ultimately, but they uncovered a few fatal things that you may hear about even today. You probably have heard this. Uh, 
uh, adding people to an already late project just makes it later. And that's what they discovered as well. They were the ones that actually discovered that. And this book was part of that. But he, he was called in on the carpet with, with the CEO of IBM, which at the time was Thomas J. Watson Jr., and because he, uh, Mr. Watson asked him, how come your projects are always late? They're over budget and they're always late. Why is that? I don't understand that. Why can't you deliver like the hardware guys do when they say they're going to deliver something, they deliver it on time and it has all the features in it and good to go. Why can't you do that? And so that's when he said, that's when Frederick Brooks sat down and said, wait a minute. You can't develop software the same way you develop hardware. And so he wrote this book, not as a way to defend himself, but to try to explain to a, a person that was in you know, the executive management of a very large company why he was having to spend more money than what they thought. You know, I don't know how many times during my career where I had people that would come and give me the, the due date. And I was like, no, 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 no. You're not giving me the due date. I will give you the due date. Uh, you know, and I would fight with them all the time on stuff. Now, my last job, I didn't have a choice. It was shut up in color. You didn't, you couldn't argue with them. They just told you to shut up in color. And they got themselves in trouble several times for it. Uh, you know, that it, they didn't listen to engineering. So uh, what can you do when you have management that just refuses to listen? You let them fall. <laughs> you let them fall and try to stay out of the way when the boulder comes running downhill because it's going to hit you too. Um, so anyway, so he, he's what well, basically this this book and it's very short. Uh, it it goes through all of the things that can go wrong in a software project and why you can't manage this like you can a standard engineering project. Software engineering. Engineering is a word, but it's actually a myth. It's not actual engineering. It's actual, more of uh, an art. So software development is an art. It is not engineering. Sorry. There are some technical aspects to software development, but most of it is an art. If you have a good programmer that understands how to translate uh, human actions into computer actions, then you have a pretty good story. But not all of them are good at that. So, yeah, some are better than others, and some are terrible. So, you, yeah, I mean, it, the other problem you have with software engineering, engineering, in quotes, uh, I'm not picking on software people. It's not their fault. This is just the way things are. Most of the time when you're developing software, you're doing something brand new, out of the box, never been done before. And that was what Fred was trying to say as well, is that, hey, you, I've never... You, we didn't have machines that did this stuff. We're inventing it as we go along. How you know? How long did it take you to develop these machines? Because yeah, you have to take that into account. We see that at, at this time in in history, the hardware guys would go ahead and just build the machine and then hand it over to the software guys and go, "Okay, make it work. Bye, see ya." And, and that didn't work out so well because there'd be things that they forgot to do. You know, like, hey, uh, I need a tracking register that tells me that this job is is uh, done. Yeah, how do I know this job is done? Huh? <laughs> how do I know it's out of memory? I, can I, how do I know when I can reclaim it? You know, it's just stuff like that. And and if you're not working together with them full time at the time they're developing the hardware, you they'll both of you will go off in different directions. And then when you try to come back together, it's like building a bridge from two ends without a without a map. You're not going to meet in the middle. <laughs> no. <laughs> Murphy's Law says you will not meet in the middle. So, and then this one, this one, this this particular chapter 11 is, I thought was just brilliant. You know, when you're building something, plan to throw one of them away because <laughs> you're going to be doing, you're going to be making changes. In, and what you start, it's just like war, right? They always say this in war. The, the, the <laughs> your plans for and your strategies for battle go right out the window the first encounter you have. And it's the same thing that happens here, that your plans for what you intended to build go right out the window as soon as you start. And there are so many reasons why that happens. Uh, yeah, one of the classic ones is 
hey, uh, can you can you add this feature for me? I, I would really like that. And then if you try to tell them no, then they go crying to the, their boss, who goes crying to, to his boss, who then goes crying to five chains up, and then it rolls back down on your boss, and your boss goes, how come you told him no? You can, well, here's the funny part about that, is that you come back with, a, with an estimate to, to add this work, and you go, oh, it's going to cost another five months. And, they, and then your boss goes, oh, no, it's not. Because he's got a bonus riding on this thing, right? So <laughs> the other one is, is an Audible book. Um, and I think, I think as, far as, the, um, as far as being able to understand what really was, was being planned. F and and these, guys, these guys were working on this stuff. Uh, late 50s, early 60s, and this was called Dream Machines, and uh, it it is it is a really interesting read. If you can get the book, read the book. If if you can't, then go listen to it on Audible. But uh, yeah, it it goes through all of the they plan everything that they thought about. We're living today. Everything they I mean, cloud, mass storage, being able to do searches, being able to yeah handle handle millions and millions and millions of users or billions as Carl Sagan would say billions and billions of users yes all of that they thought about and they actually had and now a lot of people ignored what they said and they ended up having to go back and, and, and build it the way they had actually designed it but these people were brilliant they they figured all this out you know 40 years before the technology arrived that could actually do it uh, and they knew that. They knew the technology wasn't going to handle it at the time, but they knew what was coming and they knew what they wanted. And they actually are the roadmap. That is the roadmap for where we live today. Like I said, the links are in the, in the, uh, in the notes. Um, so I, I, hope you, I hope you at least, if you can, you know, borrow the books, go to the library, get them, whatever you have to do. But I know some of them are very expensive, but uh, if you find any of them of value to you, yeah, maybe you want to buy it and put it on your shelf. I certainly did, and I have I have them on my shelf or in 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 uh, my digital library here. But I have found them to be something I go back and I refer to a lot, especially when I'm doing these videos. I refer back to those as well. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. And I hope that answered your question. Uh, I cannot remember your name. Who? Yeah, I wish I could find the comment. But the, the, I do remember the comment was, tell us what books that you used to gain a lot of your knowledge. Now, this isn't all of them, but, you know, do you want to spend a million dollars on books or a million dollars on experience? What you really need, the real trick in this industry is two things. First, have a basic understanding of, if you're a programmer, have a basic understanding of the programming language that you are currently trying to use. Because every language will feed to the next. And then all you got to do is learn the differences in the syntax and in the parts of the language that make it unique. Um, and I have found, I mean, and don't learn just one programming language. Don't go, oh, I'm, I'm good. I've got Rust. I'm done. Don't do that. Don't make that mistake. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because sometimes if a programming language becomes so overloaded with developers... This is where your this is where your salary will go down the hill. You won't get your raises, um, and so a lot of, some sal some programming jobs become hotter. And so if you want better paying jobs, you might want to spin over to the next language. Now, how many do I know? Hmm, that's a good question. I've never counted them up. I'm guessing twenty, maybe twenty five, uh, that I have learned over the time. Some of them are dead. Uh, long dead, they're not used anymore. But and it, it doesn't matter because they all carry forward at some point. Yeah, I always I always hear these guys that are going back looking at old programming languages. Oh, this one was stupid. Why did they do this? And it's like, buddy, you weren't there. You have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea what came before that one. So yeah, they were all improvements. Believe me. They were all, except for maybe Cobol. Uh, Cobol, I don't know what they were really trying to do with that. And uh, it was fine until somebody said, go to's are harmful. <laughs> and then it turned into a, a nightmare. It was already pretty bad, and then they made it worse. Anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Hope you enjoyed this. And 
Um, if you've got a favorite book that you'd like me to, to add to this list, do so. I would love to hear it. Uh, put it in the comments below. Uh, always looking for something that, that uh, I haven't thought of. I mean, I'm not the world's expert. I, I generally learn what is in my, in my, is, is in my way. <laughs> There's something in my way that I need to learn to get to a solution. Then I will go study it. I will go play with it. But I've never been a, you, you, in this industry. One last piece of advice. In this industry, you can never go, oh, I know everything I need to know. And no, don't do that. Don't make that mistake. Uh, yeah, because that's, that's, that's bull. Yeah, it, you, you do not know everything there is to know. And trust me, you never will. <laughs> you never will. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. I mean, I never will. So I've got a long way to go, too. Hope you enjoy this today. And I hope to see you in the next video. And bye for now.